We're going to continue our uh, looking into the issues of the Godhead, the doctrine of the Godhead. And uh, last time we looked at Jesus Christ and, and uh, the, He is the Godhead bodily. And we looked at that and we, we, we worked down through uh, all of that. And I want to pick up now on two passages in your scriptures that deal with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as a member of the Godhead. And again, Godhead is the, is the biblical term. Uh, we use Trinity, and that's fine, the triune uh, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, Father, Word, and Spirit, however, you know, how you like to do that. Um, again, He was born uh, the Lord was born, incarnated, and so there is a humanity component, and that's really what we're going to begin to look at in, in this issue of, of the Lord, as we think about the Lord, and when we come to what Scripture teaches about Him, okay? There's a lot of man-made theology out there about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk a little bit this morning in Philippians 2, and, and you will hear people say, that uh, he emptied himself of all of his deity. And you'll hear people say he was subordinate to the Father, i.e. there's a hierarchy in the Godhead. And you, and you hear people run with that. You'll hear people say he really isn't God. He, he was uh, begotten of, so therefore he only contains components of deity and so forth and you hear all these weird but when you come to scripture scripture does not teach that at all what it does teach is what i want to look at and we're, we're going to start here with hebrews 5 just give you the verse so you can see it and then we're going to spend a lot of time in philippians 2 that's the other reference because that's where the apostle paul shines further progressive revelation on the subject matter of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he does that, he, we see that the Lord chose to do something that was he never, the Godhead never experienced before. And that is he chose to become man and humanity. And just as he is a 100% God, he is also a 100% humanity. So if he is 100% humanity, and he is, then that means he chose to do some things in his makeup and his uh, relatability. And his, in other words, he took on our likeness. Therefore, he took on our what? Our limitations. He, took on, he didn't take on our nature, sin nature. He takes on our like. He took on something else. And we're going to see that as we go. And again, Hebrews 5, we'll just read the verse here, and then we'll get into it. Um, uh, we'll, 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 we will come and spend a little time in Hebrews 5 in, in the future. We are, in, by the way, you realize we are entering the Easter season. Everything is about Easter and the resurrection. You and I do not celebrate the resurrection on one day on a calendar. We celebrate the resurrection every day. And I'm hoping that we can end on March 31st with the issue of he became obedient unto death and specifically even the death of the cross. And if not, it may be another, we might go into the first weekend of April, depending on how far I can get through them, how quickly I can get through the information. I was informed that the clock was three minutes fast. So it, it's now, you know, so when uh, I moved it back, that's what I was doing. So we fix it right, okay? All right? So everybody chuckles, but you know what? The preacher does this. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. So, okay? Hebrews 5, look at verse 8. And, and again, what I want you to notice is I want you to just notice what Scripture says. Get out of the theology books, Okay? Get out of Schofield notes and the other notes that we read. Just look at what the verse says. Though he, and the he is going to be a reference to Christ in verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be a high priest and so forth. Verse 8, though he, that's Christ, were a son. 
You see the capital S. What is that? Deity. Okay? Yet, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now look at that verse. Now what the theologians do is they go twisty, twisty, and they blow up, and they come over here, and then they get a new Bible, and they rewrite the verse, and then they go over here, and they, they begin to play the Greek game and all this stuff. But just look at what the verse said. Is he deity? Yeah, he's son. But yet he what? Learned he obedience. He had to learn the issue of what obedience entailed. That implies something new in his experience. He's not always been this way. As God, he knows it all. He doesn't have to learn any. He knows it. But as man, what does he have to? He has to learn obedience. There's something that he didn't do prior to his incarnation. And now in his incarnation, he did it. Now, how does he learn obedience? By the things which he suffered. He's never suffered before. Now he's going to suffer. You see how that, that verse just destroys theology and the goofy ball ideas out there. He learns in his humanity. He's going to learn something. It's not always been the condition. Now come to Philippians 2. It's not always been the condition. Again, we'll look through some scripture when we get into Hebrews 5. And what Hebrews 5 tells us is that he, the Lord has, he is going to experience something that he's never done before. This is not the normal condition in the Savior, in the Son's life. There's something new on board now. And the new is the issue of his humanity and the incarnation. Before, he's good to go. Now, there's something added to the situation. So the, the, the doctrine of eternal subordination, which says in the nutshell that Jesus Christ was always subordinate to the Father and will always be, is a lie. It's heresy because what did Romans, what does Hebrews 5 verse 8 say? He was son and yet he had to go do something that wasn't the normal. But he chose to do that and this is where the Apostle Paul comes in and helps us understand this in Philippians 2 starting in verse 5 down through verse number 8. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here is the mindset of the original grace thinker. Here's the mindset of the original grace thinker. What did he think? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself him and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That is a very powerful passage. And we're going to spend a few weeks here in this passage. Because as our apostle tells us, here's the mindset of, of our Savior. Here's the mindset of the Son Verse 6, being, I, I, I love that, who being in the form of God. You see that being? That's a present tense word. Presently, right now. Here is who he is. He's going to review some things here. He's going to reveal some things here about the invisible God. By the way, he doesn't say, who was in the form of God, past tense. In other words, he was this, and then he became this, and he left that. That's going to help us when we look at that word reputation here in a minute, which is the Greek word kenosis, which means in the, in the Greek, emptied. We have a song in our songbook, he emptied himself. Now, he doesn't empty himself of anything, see. And reputation is going to be the appropriate uh, translation by your translators. We'll get into that in just a minute, okay? But what I want you to see is being, 
Paul uses the present tense. He was and always will be in the family of God. He will always be a member of the Godhead. He will always be. He, not, he doesn't lose it because he's over here now in humanity. He's equal to God. He thought it not robbery. I'm not robbing anything from the Father or from the Holy Ghost to say that I am God. I'm not robbing anybody of anything. I'm not diminishing the Father or the Spirit. I am God. You, follow, you see what he's doing there? He's, Paul is protecting the deity of the Savior, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's equal to God. There is no question. Again, notice all the words. They're all important here. As God, what did he do? As God, what did he do? Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. All right, so as God, what did he do? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What did he do as God? He, made, he humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He does something. He made, that word made, out of the ordinary. Not the normal thing here. What is the normal thing? He's God. You remember that verse in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21? You do. I don't. <laughs> that helps, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us. The Lord Jesus Christ was never to be sin. He was what? What did the Father do? made him. When we look at Calvary and he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am not a man. I am but a worm. What The father made him out of the ordinary, he took something that was normally this and put it over into something that it was not intended to be. What did he do as God? He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. He took upon himself. Go back to Philippians 2. He took upon himself. You see, he's doing some things here as what? As God. He's not just, oh, I think I'll let God, my godness go, and I'll come over here and be humanity. No. He says, as God, I chose to do something. I have chose to, he's going to do something that he has never done before. He made himself, but made himself. Verse 8, he humbled himself. He does this not with a gun to his head by the Father. He does this on his, of his own will, of his own decision making. None of the, no mandate, no legal mandate, do this or else. He doesn't do any of that. He just, he, he looks at that Titus 1, 2. We made a promise to provide eternal life, the redemptive plan for humanity. We made the bond, the promise together. Here's the plan that the Father developed, and I choose to play this role in the plan. The Godhead doesn't, the Father and the Spirit don't say, okay, you better do it or else. There's no compulsory. There's no compulsion. There's, there's nothing he was never made to do this, mandated. He willingly, he humbled himself. He took upon himself. And again, that's a departure from the norm. And he's doing it for you and I, and that's going to be the, the glory point. Look over with me at John 10. Just, just notice some things here as we think about this. John chapter 10. And... Quite honestly, the Apostle Paul spends some great time dealing with this, but look at John 10. Just see the mindset here. John 10, verse 17. John 10, 17, verse we're all very familiar with. John 10, 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, 
because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Notice Notice the decision-making pro. Who's in charge of making the decisions? He is of himself. I lay it down. I take it up. Every, over and over again, they'll come up and they'll do something and, and the, the Lord will make an offhand comment of, my hour's not come. My hour's not here yet. It's not time for me to be revealed. It's my hour. And then all of a sudden he says, my hour is here. What does he know? He knows the plan. He knows that when it happens, it's time to go. He knows that it, now it's time to go to Calvary. Now it's time to go to the garden. When those bozos show up in the garden to take him and, the, and Judas betrays him, he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, oh, he's over there. Go get him. He's around the corner. You know, he says, here I am. And lays them out. And then they get up and ask again, the dummies. Lays them out again. I mean, figure one time, you know, <laughs> quit asking. He does it. I. The Godhead didn't sentence one of the members to, die, to death, to die. The Father says, here's the plan. The Son says, I. Look at verse 18. I lay it down of myself. I've got the power to do this. Why? Because that's part of the program. That's the commandment of the Father over here. You see, the Lord in his, when we look at the words here, and we begin, come back to Philippians. Well, you know what? Go over to Galatians 1. We'll just run some verses here. You think about this. When, when the Son says, I, again, not a manipulation by the Father or the Spirit, not a demand, not a death sentence. Now, is there a death sentence? Yes. But what he willingly chose to die. I'll do this, I'll do it, and I'm going to do it at the right time. Now, think about Galatians, think about Paul. Well, watch Paul do this. Galatians 1 verse 4. Verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Notice that. Who gave himself? How, why did the Lord give himself? Because it was according to the will of God the Father. It was according to the will and the word of the Father. Say that. He doesn't come over here, oh, God says, I, the Father says, I got to die now. It's time to die. He doesn't say that at all. He goes, I gave himself. Chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 20. By the way, this is an important thing because Paul five times says, gave himself, gave himself, gave himself. 2.20, Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. My point is, is what Jesus, Jesus Ephesians 5, uh, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 6 who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus 2 and verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Do you get the idea that he gave himself? He's not manipulated. Jesus Christ, what he does and what, he's, what he did was not by legal mandate. 
not under the law, not under legal, the rules. Rather, he did what he did in accordance to the promise that the Godhead had made to each other, Titus 1 verse 2. And when he did that and he saw the plan, he says, I will play this role in the plan and I will choose willingly to not be my will and what I would have done. I'm going to do now what the will of the Father says that needs to be done. And I chose to do it. Go back to Philippians 2. That's why Paul uses the present tense language and how he talks here in Philippians 2. So the language here, no legal compulsion, no do it or else. And look back at Matthew. Matthew 20. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. You have to think about this. And you've got to pull your emotion out because when we talk about Christ limiting himself, people go, oh, you just limited God. Oh. In his deity, no limit. In his humanity, what? Limits. He does it himself. He does it to himself. That's the point here. No one is doing it to the Son. He, when he decided, when he chose equal with God, thought it not robbery to be there, when he says, you know what, I'm going to do as God, Philippians 2, when he says that he's God, he says, I'm going to descend, I'm going to be, I'm going to do this, this, and this. When he does that, there's no limitations to his deity. There is now limitations in his humanity because he's got your likeness. Not your sin nature, but your likeness. And you know what? You don't know it all. And we'll demonstrate how the Father teaches him. We'll demonstrate how the, the, the Father is going to come to the Son now in his humanity and is going to teach him. The Word of God is going to teach him. And then God's going to reveal. Do you realize that the, seek, the mysteries of the kingdoms, those parables in Matthew 13, 14, all that, almost none of that is in the Old Testament? That is God the Father revealing to God the Son in the moment information that as God, as, as the Son of Man, He doesn't know and understand, and God's teaching Him because it's not there. I mean, you got to think about this. Get out of the theology books. Get out of the, 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 the nonsense. And get in Scripture and plot this stuff out. It's fascinating. Well, now, that's in three weeks, okay? Or, well, in a couple weeks, Okay. What did I tell you? Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Uh, you start in verse 47. You've got the betrayal, okay, with Judas. Verse uh, 52. Uh, well, we got verse 51. Peter's take head hunting with the servant there. Uh, Malchus takes off his ear. The Lord says, verse 52, put it up again. Uh, thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Now watch. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Peter, don't you, don't you understand the relationship that I have with the heavenly father? All I got to do is make a phone call. And he'll send 72,000 angels. A legion is roughly... 6,000 men. There's 12 of them. I can, I can make a phone call. I can drop a text. And the Father will rescue me. But now look at the next verse. But, uh-oh, how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? You know what he knew? He knew by being learned, and come back to Philippians 2, he knew from learning from this Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah that he was. He learned from the Father that he was. We'll look over in Psalms and in Isaiah, and he says, you've opened mine ears, and I didn't turn them back. I, my ear wasn't rebellious. I learned. I get, you gave me the ear of the learned. That's the Lord talking to the Father. And he, and he comes over, and he says, Pete, put it away. We're good to go. We're right on schedule. So in the garden, when he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Hey, Father, is there a way for the cup to pass? That isn't a question of getting out of it. It's, a, it's really a statement of fact. 
Is the cup still needed? Did you find a loophole somewhere in the plan? Nope, you didn't. It doesn't matter if you did or not. I'm still doing it, see. Not legal mandate, not compulsory, but rather, Philippians 2 verse 5, a mindset. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was his mindset? As God, how was he thinking? What was he thinking? Well, how about verse 6? He who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Again, very clear. He knew who he was. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. He did this. The Father doesn't do it to him. The Spirit doesn't do it to him. If it, by the way, if you think he did, the verse is a lie. So then all the other verses are liars, and we might as well sell the buildings and go hunting or camping or vacation because then what are we doing? The verse says what the verse says, but made himself of no reputation. And now here comes the problem because theology now steps in and says the Greek word under reputation is kenosis k-e-n I had it here k-e-n-o-s-i-s the verb kino the noun kino the verb kenosis and they say see kenosis it means emptied So what Jesus Christ did was he emptied himself of all of his deity. Well, that's a little problematic. Then they say, and and you deal with that. He's got to be the kinsman. He's got to be God. Only God can forgive sins, et cetera, et cetera. They say, well, okay, all right, you got us there, uncle. Now what needs to happen is you need to understand that your King James Bible translators knew nothing of what they were doing, and they mistranslated it, and so they pull out the NIV and all the new new versions, and they say, see, it says that he emptied himself and took upon, and they, use, and they throw empty in there, and, I, and then so now we've got a, we have a translation issue, don't we? That's another problem, isn't it? Because when you come to the King James Bible, and you, become, and you begin to look at it, and you begin to think about what's happening, the word reputation is the proper translation of the Greek word kenosis. And when you run the verses, you know what you quickly learn? Where that Greek word kenosis shows up, the translators understood how to translate it emptied. It's very fascinating. So we're going to run those verses here for just a minute. But I want to read you something out of, out of a dictionary, Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary. It says that kenosis, kino, in the most basic sense means emptied, but it is proper to translate it with a more precise word that fits the context. The context that surrounds The verb is what explains its meaning. All translations translate the form of kenosis in very ways, but always according to context. So guess what? Context is king. And you just can't willy-nilly say empty, empty, and ignore the context. Now, go with me to Luke 1. Let's just run some of the verses where kino, kenosis is used, and watch how they translate it. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You take these references, Luke 1, Romans 4, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 15, and you can study out the context on your own, and you can see why the translators use the very precise word. And if you can't, email me, and I'll, I'll download my notes for you, okay? Because what happens is Luke 1, verse 53... Luke 1, verse 53. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. You see that word empty? Guess what Greek word that is? Kenosis. Ta-da! They know how to translate it. Woohoo! Look at that. But the context that Luke 1, 53 sits in, which is the adoration of, uh, of Mary about the babe in her belly, 
the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he's going to be and what he's going to demands a very precise word to be used, and it is used empty. Now, again, you can study it out. Come over to Romans 4 because I don't want to take the two hours to do that if we did each one. We can, but then we'll never be done until July. <laughs> Okay, and I'd like to be in some other studies by then, okay? All right, look at Romans 4. Romans 4 and verse 14. Now, what's Romans 4? Romans 4 is the great faith chapter, and it's a great use of Abraham and David and the issue of, the, of faith being on the, the, the fundamental issue. 414, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. You see the void? Guess what Greek word that is? Kenosis. Ta-da! So they can use it how? Void. Now, when you get into the details and the weeds here, you begin to understand that void is something that's a little different than none effect. Void is more bam. Why? Because the law is now what? Void. It's done away with. See more precise, very precise word used there. Come over to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17. You see, your tra the translators of the King James Bible knew very well what they were doing. You can never, please never be mad at them for knowing more about your English language than you do and subsequently knowing more about Hebrew and Greek than you ever will know because they did. And they didn't do it for filthy lucre's sake. They did it for having the Bible in the common man's vernacular. English, by the way. 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of what? Guess what none effect is? Kenosis. Ta-da! So, so we've got empty... We've got void, and we've got none effect. Very precise, see. You didn't void the Word of God. You made it what? Not have the impact that it was designed to have. And how did they do that? From the context, how did they do that? They got divisions, verse 10, and contentions, and they got all this wrangling, and then somebody put baptism up as the number one thing, verse 14, 15, and 16. What'd they do to the Word of God? They, it lost its impact. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So what happened here is with the kenosis and the Greek debate is people didn't like the f reputation thing. They want to lessen the import of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the center of the volume. The volume of the book is written is concerning me. We're going to devalue, de deify the Lord Jesus Christ. How? By rearranging a few words and doing this and causing him to lose his deity because we can't have a three member and they all be equal and of the same. So, you know what they come up? By the way, here's a crazy idea. They say, God the Father, God is one. And in the Old Testament, he manifests himself as the Father, the Almighty. And then in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he manifests himself as the Son. And then in early Acts, to the end, he's the Spirit. But it's only one guy, and he's taking on these three. And it's like, say what? They've never read a Bible verse in their life. Say all you got to do is go read 1 John 5, verse 7 and 8, and you, you understand that. You go read the 1 Corinthians 6, 1, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, and you see the three listed. Read the end of Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, you, it's, you know, duh. But what that, anyway, I get off my 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than you all, than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You see, vain, not in vain, vain, that's the word kenosis. So the translators 
fully understand how to translate the word. Now come to Philippians 2, okay? They translated it empty, which is what the Greek word means, but how? The context. They did it void. They did it in none effect. They do it in vain, with vain. And then in Philippians 2, they do it with reputation, of no reputation. So if you think about the no reputation, what is he emptying? Emptying of what? what is, what's going on here? What, what's the context of 2.7 when he says, when Paul uses the word kenosis and then the translators say he made himself of no reputation? What's going on here in the context of Philippians? See? So real quick, reputation. In the Oxford English Dictionary, that's the big book, okay? There are several definitions and several definitions that have gone off about reputation. But here's here, the condition, the quality, or fact of being highly regarded or esteemed. Another one, the estimation, the credit, or assumption of being or possessing something. Another one, the common or general estimation of a person with respect to character and other qualities. The relative estimation or esteem in which a person or thing is held. Do you hear that word esteem keeps coming up? What's going on in Philippians 2? Go back up to verse 1. See the context. If there therefore be any cons- if if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. What did God the Son, as God, empty himself of? His reputation of being who? Of being God. The esteem, the esteem or estimation in which a person holds. What did he hold? He's God. He says, I'm not going to be God when I go do this humanity thing. Look at, do you, look at verse 1. Or, I'm sorry, verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be, what? Like-minded. Here's the mind of Christ. Verse 3. Are being of one accord, of one mind. So we're going to, here's how God the Son thought about relationship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and then ultimately you as sinner, as enemy. What did, how did he think? Well, look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or what? Vainglory. That's a level of glory, vainglory. That's a level of glory where one seeks to to impose an advantage over others. In other words, I'm better than you, and I'm proving the point. Now, let me ask you something. Could God the Son say that, that he's better than you? Sure, he's God. He's creator God. He spoke, it's there. We looked at it last week, the word, the word, the word, the word. Vainglory. He could have sought an advantage over everyone else. But what did he do? Verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. He's going to choose not to express or experience the place of the position of glory that he has a right to. 
He has a right, John 17, he has a right to glory. He says, I'm not going to express that. I'm not going to expect it. I'm not going to demand it. I'm going to make myself. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to take upon the form of a servant. We'll see the verse when we look a little lower than the angels. Angels are servants, ministering spirits. They, he goes, I ain't even going to be one of them. I'm going to go lower than that to man. And I'm going to take on a death that no man would ever take on, and that's the death of the cross. He's going to dis- think about what he's doing. He's going to demonstrate the godly way of thinking about oneself. How does God think about oneself? So he does what? He self limits. He self restricts. He self imposes. He's not consumed with that outward expression of his glory. You remember what he says in John? Look there in John 17, I think it is. You guys are looking at me like I'm nuts. John 17, verse 5. John 17, 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I don't have it right now. I'm going to get it in a little bit with the resurrection. I want that glory we had back there before we all started this mess. (laughs) Titus 1, 2. Lowliness, Philippians 2, verse 3. Lowliness of my, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Okay, so I'm not going to express my glory. I have a right to it. I'm God. I have a legal claim on it, but I'm not going to. But in lowliness of mind, as God, what did Christ choose to do? He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to demand my glory, which I have every right to. But rather, I'm going to think this way. And verse 3 then describes what it is to think in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Esteem others. That's the, con- that's the contrast to the vainglory. What's vainglory? Me, 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 me. Look at me, look at me. That's what man does, right? Me, 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 me. Okay? Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl. What did they have? Big old party. Why? Look at us. We're riding down the float. Look at us. Look at us. Jesus Christ says, I'm not, I, don't, I could do that. I have every right to do that. But now I'm going to esteem other. My gl- my, the vain glory, my glory isn't the issue. The issue is having a lowliness of mind and esteeming others better than myself. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go as son, capital S, and I'm going to sign on to the plan of God the Father called glory and the redemptive program that we, dis- we promised Titus 1-2 before the world began that we would go do, and I'm going to sign on to that and subscribe to it, and I'm going to take my... Me, who I claim I can be, and I'm going to sit it right over there in the chair. I don't leave it. I don't lose it. I'm not diversity, getting it out of me. I'm just not going to act that way. I'm going to come over here now, and I'm going to take on the form of a servant, and I'm going to take on the likeness of man, and I'm going to go do the plan. So I'm going to esteem the Father better than myself. I'm going to esteem the Spirit better than myself. Follow that? See what's happening? No reputation. Right word. It's a precise word, okay? Why? Because the context is teaching you and I how we can think and are to think like God thinks. How did God think? I'm going to esteem the Word of God far better than my Word. I'm going to esteem others around me now. Verse 4, by the way. I love verse 4 because everybody just trips over and keeps moving. Look at verse 4. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's what we're doing. That's what the son's doing. You know what he's doing? He's looking at the good of the father and the, son, and the spirit. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do. And by the way, we worked that all out in the beginning. When, when we started this four, le- four weeks ago, we talked about this and that plan, that Titus 1-2 promise and the reputation here. 
And has to, the, the fundamentally it has to do with verse 3. That's my point. No reputation is him doing verse number 3. My glory isn't first and foremost. My lowliness of mind, the way I'm thinking, I'm going to esteem someone else better than myself. Verse 4, I'm thinking about the, the Father different. I'm considering His idea and His plan and the Spirit's activity and working in there. The, he, when you think about what the Son says in John 14 and John 16, and He says, hey, the Spirit's going to come, and we're going to pre-authorize the writing of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then he comes over in chapter 16 and says, we're going to pre-authorize the writing of Acts and Hebrews through Revelation, because that's all that they are operating on. That's all they understand. And we're going to pre-authorize that. And you know who's going to do it, guys? The Spirit's going to do it, because i got to go and finish out my side of the program and the plan, and the Spirit's going to come, and you're not going to have to worry about what you're going to say and study in the book. It's just going to be given to you. Why? Because the Spirit's going to act that way. Now, that's not you and I, but that's the thinking that the Son has. That's what Paul's manifesting. But there's something else, there's someone else in verse 4 than the Father and the Spirit. There is you and I, the sinner. Because what do you and I need? We need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need a Rescuer. We need a kinsman redeemer. Romans 5, 8. But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. When, when Christ died, what were you at that moment? Sinner. Well, you weren't even born, but okay. Sinner. Transgr enemy. And what did he do? He still made himself of no reputation for you, the sinner. So when you think about this no reputation, you always have to remember the context is deriving what the word means and what word is to be used. And what we're learning is, is that Jesus Christ is going to put on display what it means for one to not seek one's own personal glory but rather choose to willingly esteem others, not only their family and friends, but their enemies, better than themselves. And what you have is you have this picture. Nothing to do here, by the way, with Jesus Christ releasing his deity. He didn't remove himself from being God. Verse 6 is clear of that. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If God, if he removed deity, verse 6 wouldn't even be there. Can't be there. But it is. Why? Because he doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, I'm willingly going to esteem my Father and the Spirit. And I'm also going to esteem the sinner. Lost Adam. Lost man. Because that's what they need. Okay? So get off of the, it's time to quit. Don't, get, don't stay on this, well, the Greek, 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 Greek. No, your translators did it right. You can trust it. Because reputation, the relative estimation or esteem in which a person or thing is held. And what are we doing? Don't vainglory it. Esteem other better than, it's right there. The definition is right there in the verses. Now, verse 7 but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled. Well, now we're going to pick up in verse 7 and talk about the servant and the man. By the way, he takes on the form of a servant. Whose servant is he? He's God the Father's servant. Whose man is he ultimately going to be? God the Father's, see? So he's not doing this devout... The three members of the Godhead are actively involved in his incarnation. We saw that. They're actively involved in him taking on the form of a servant and the form of a man. That's the incarnation. Okay? They're actively, they play their roles and they do their things. And we'll see all that as we work through these passages. In verse 5 to 8, 
there are seven steps to the Godhead descending out of the third heaven and coming and walking among man and then going to die, the death of the cross. There's seven steps there. And we just, we're taking them in chunks, okay? All right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for everything that we have in your Son. We thank you for all that you provided to us through your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that you esteemed us, the sinner, better than yourself in that moment of decision-making that you made before the foundation of the world, before the beginning of everything, when you made that decision to come and to be our propitiation. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.